Okay, well, good morning for those of you who have joined us online. We apologize for the delay. Um, we have a nice new camera system and are still working out some of the bugs and trying to get that working properly. So for this morning, we'll be coming to you from our webcam, our temporary solution, and hopefully be back with the new camera system next week. But we are so glad that you have joined us on this chilly Sunday morning, and we hope and pray that you are uh, keeping warm at home with your families and that you are ready to, to worship the Lord together as a family. Um, just so you're aware, because uh, offering can't be given in person this week, if you would like to give online, you can go to our church website or to the Vanco app, which can be downloaded in the App Store, and you are welcome to, to give electronically that way. Uh, we have moved our new members class to February 21st, as opposed to last week when it was supposed to be and was canceled due to the we due to weather. So that'll be a, still from noon to three, but now it'll be on February 21st, as opposed to last week. And uh, please make sure that you contact the church office if you would like to sign up so that we can get you on our list for that. Our church-wide study of Revelation is beginning this morning, and I realized that I forgot my book that I was up here to, to show everyone, but if you still need one of these study books for the Revelation study, those are $10 and they can be purchased from the church office any day throughout the week. Um, please contact the church office if you plan on purchasing one or more of those books because we have a bit of a waiting list as we had to order some more books. So just feel free to uh, contact the church office if you'd like a small group Revelation study book and we're happy to get that to you. Uh, we just finished our sermon series, uh, our sermon series on idols, and if you would like a copy of that um, that chart that we had about the different source idols, if you would like to take that for your own personal reference, you can grab one of those from the ministry table next week, and you can also get one from the church office. And then uh, just a quick update on the building. So we are continuing to make progress. We have some great construction workers and our electricians who are in there and uh, we just finished doing some painting of different parts of the ceiling yesterday so there's lots of good stuff going on in there and hopefully we'll be back to you sometime later this week with another building update and you'll be able to see the beginning uh, stages of the stage itself being built and some more of the walls being hung so that will be really exciting so we hope to have that to you sometime later this week. I'll move into a time of praises and prayers. You're welcome to lift up your praises and your prayers on Facebook in the comments section. We also welcome you if you go from your computer or phone to our church website uh, on the top of the church website from a computer. There is a little button that says prayer requests. If you click that, you can enter your prayer requests electronically. You can also scroll down on that page to see prayer requests uh, of others and to also um, let them know after you've prayed over that prayer request. From your cell phone, you will have to click connect on the church website and then scroll down and there'll be a little icon for the prayer request page. And you are uh, welcome to, to lift up your prayer request there on the church website and then others can, can pray for you in that way. Some continued prayers that we just ask that you might lift up in your own hearts this morning are prayers for Mark Boyce for Ruth Crystal, Dusty Rhodes, uh, Don Lala, Mark, Brenda, and Gabe Jaden uh, as they continue in their, their journey to help get Gabe healthy. Continue to pray for James and Lois Wood's daughter, Barbara Candy, who is struggling with breast cancer. Continued prayers for healing for Linda Schultz, Karen Chapman, Darlene Squire's grandson, great-grandson, excuse me, Julie's grandson, Ryder Boss. Continued prayers for his healing. Mike and Tracy Taylor's niece, Valerie, Terry Warren's parents, uh, and then also Max and Mary Warren, who are fighting COVID. Jamie Shuck's sister, Nicole, who has a thyroid condition after chemo. Uh, just prayers for discernment for the doctors, for her, for Nicole. Um, for Julie Feasley's cousin, who had a heart attack on Friday, prayers for strength, that he might be able to, uh, to gain some strength enough to be able to go into surgery. And then uh, please pray also for Pat Burrell's brother, Jack, who passed away yesterday and went to be with our Lord and, and prayers for Pat and her entire family. Uh, and then continued prayers for Pastor Andrew and Amy and their family as they uh, continue to, to work through the loss of Pastor Andrew's grandfather, Richard. 
With that, would you please this morning join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we lift up to you all of those things that we have prayed, uh, those things that we have prayed aloud, those things that we have lifted up to you in our hearts or together with our families. We know that you are a God who hears prayer. And so we will be a church who will continue to lift up uh, both our praises to you and our concerns, God, knowing that you hear us. And so this morning, as we come to you from wherever we are, we pray that your grace would be among us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would intercede uh, through these electronics, that they would make the words that will come from Brenda and from Pastor Andrew, that they would be transformed by your Holy Spirit and received into our hearts, Lord, in the midst of times that are trying and troubling, God, that we would be strengthened by the warmth and presence of your Holy Spirit. And so we lift all of these things up to you, God, praying uh, together with our families and praying together in our own hearts the words that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, I will pass it over to Brenda for our children's message. Okay. All right. Well, when Jesus' disciple John wrote the last book of the Bible that we call Revelation, he was a prisoner. The Roman government did not like someone telling their citizens that there might be someone more powerful, a more powerful force than Rome. And so they put him in jail on the island of Patmos. And it was there on the island that John tells us that he saw a vision from God. And a vision is kind of like a dream. Now, the first part of this vision that he had is something I couldn't really make or draw or act out. So I want you to use your imaginations and to help you do that. I want you to close your eyes and imagine, imagine what I'm going to tell you from the book of Revelation. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. I saw someone. Someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, white as the snow, and his eyes were blazing like fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a hot furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, sharp, stubble-edged sword, and his face was like the sun. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. Then he placed his right hand on me, and he said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Wow, can you imagine what that must have been like? What if you were to dream of a superhero with all the superpowers there ever were, with eyes like fire? Fire. And, and hands full of stars. Oh. John is seeing a glimpse of Jesus for the first, for the first um, few chapters there. And then the next 18 chapters or so of Revelation, Jesus and some of his angels will show John what's going to happen at the end of the world. Now, John describes a world that is breaking out in war. Tough stuff. And... And everywhere, people are starving for food. And 
and there's lots of disease. Oops. Lots of disease. Disease. There, that's better. <sighs> and eventually a brand new kind of government is set up that opposes everything God wants. So it's not looking very good at this point. War, disease, starvation, a, a bad different government that opposes God, not good stuff. So there's basically two teams. We have Team Jesus, that's a good team. And then we have Team Not Jesus, that's not a good team. Well, the last half of John's vision is all about the all-powerful Jesus winning over Satan and all that evil. In fact, John describes for us what it's going to be like when King Jesus shows up to take his rightful place as king of all the world. And this sounds like something right out of a superhero story, except this one is totally true. John writes down this vision to give us a kind of a heads up on what the future is going to be like. He wants us to decide now before it's too late. Which side do you think you're going to want to be on? Will you make Jesus king of your life? Will you decide that you want to be with King Jesus and be on the Lord's team? I know I do. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for how you described in glorious words and vision to John about, about how you are and how wonderful and all powerful you are. And thank you for the hope that we have that you're going to win in the end. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brenda. That's a great message. Good morning. It is good to see everybody. We are glad uh, again that you are joining us uh, from home. And uh, again, just a, a extension of grace as we're uh, figuring out some different technology, our new technology, and we're grateful uh, to be here live streaming to you this morning. Uh, this morning, as as we do get into our word, I'm going to be reading from the NIV scripture here. And if uh, you've got your Bibles handy, I want to invite you to pull those out and. Uh, if you're not using a, a hardback or softback today, uh, pull out your phone and go to your Bible app because we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. And in our uh, study book, this is uh, the lesson that's titled The Son of Man. And this study of Revelation is about apocalyptic visions and timeless principles. So I want to do a little introduction here before we get into this word, a little bit of context, a little bit of uh, helping us understand why we have this book of Revelation, what takes place within, and then we're going to jump into the word and we're going to break it down a little bit. The first thing I want you to know, and you already probably know this, Revelation is a hard book. It, it just is. And it is one that oftentimes Christians shy away from or don't even open because there's a lot of imagery, there's a lot of symbols, there's a lot of things that take place, uh, especially in the language in which the book is, is written, that's hard for us to comprehend. It's not our, our everyday traditional literature that we're accustomed to. So that being said, this is going to be an amazing study that we all are going to be learning together. And, and myself, Pastor Tyler, uh, any of our leadership, we, we are willing and, and knowing already going in advance that we are going to learn with you because we don't have all the answers and there are different understandings about this part and that part. And we'll get into a little bit of that this morning. However, the biggest thing is that we ask that you would be obedient and, and faithful to the study with us um, as, as Brenda gave great imagery of some of the things that were taking place while Revelation was written and the things that have uh, happened before that. It's going to help us understand in the long term, where are we going and why are we here 
now? Um, because that's ultimately the question we need to ask ourselves. Do we know where we're spending eternity? And uh, what a great way to dig in uh, to that question through Revelation. So this morning we're going to talk about chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. And, and as it's titled in our study guide, it's, it's the Son of Man. And all of it begins with two words, the Revelation. Now, another word for revelation is apocalypse, which, is, which means both revelation and apocalypse mean an unveiling. There's a disclosing. So this letter of revelation is unveiling. It's d- disclosing in a very timely order great persecution of Christians and their faith, pressure from the world, and death of Christians and their faith. Why? Because of their acknowledgement as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as the only one and true God. Now, as we will learn, there's pressure from the state, there's pressure from religious institutions, there's pressure from the economy, and even in their fellow church members, there is pressure. At the, at the time in which Revelation is, is uh, recorded, Jesus' resurrection had occurred 65 years before God spoke through and in John for this letter of Revelation. This is what a lot of people think is, is written around 95 AD. That's after the death of Jesus. And there's a emperor, and I'm going to probably mess his name up, and I'm going to do that a lot throughout this study of Revelation. Uh, but his name was Emperor Domitian, and he was in power and demanded that he be addressed as God. And we might think that's strange, but he's trying to fill the shoes of the man that came before him, who was Emperor Nero. And he was known for being a ruthless leader with great persecution of Christians. So Nero wanted to be addressed as, as, as God, as Lord, as, as Messiah. And he hated Christians so much that even to a point that the persecution of Christians, they were, they were hung along roads on lampstands, and they were lit at, to light the roads. That's how much the emperor hated the Christians. So there's, there's this ongoing persecution from the leadership, from the emperor, that hates Christians, that doesn't want the gospel, the good news, to be spreading. The life and condition of the Christian is not good. And for the majority of this, uh, this writing here, is being addressed to second-generation Christians. If you think about that, the early disciples, the apostles, they, they were first-hand witnesses. They were there, they walked with Christ, they, they witnessed everything that took place, and now as time has gone on, they have passed. So they're passing on what they've known, what they've seen, and what they've written down to the second generation. And here is John. John the Apostle, who is exiled to Patmos. Now, for this uh, this recording, this book to be written, it's very interesting, and, and I want to tell you why. We understand from scholar and from history and, and from technology and from archaeological finds that what we know as the Bible was complete, everything that we have in our biblical canon was complete by 90 A.D. So now this is 95 A.D., that all of this is taking place. So you have the whole Bible before this. So people have scripture. People have this. And John is addressing churches. And we'll get into that in chapter 2 and 3 of these letters to these seven churches. He's addressing to them of what they know. And he's, he's drawing from the Old Testament, from their tradition, from the scriptures, from both oral and written, for them to understand this revelation. But here's the thing. Why was John exiled to this island? Well, that's a great question. There are two theories. Uh, One is that John was poisoned because they hated the fact that he was spreading the gospel, that he was sharing the good news about Jesus Christ to other people. One tradition is that they poisoned him and it didn't kill him, so they exiled him. The other tradition is that uh, he was put into a boiling cauldron and survived and and didn't die and so they exiled him to this island whatever the case whatever the tradition is wherever you might land or think on that the important thing is is that god was intervening and what the world and what the government what 
all the people around them that were anti-Christian, didn't want this good news to be spread, what they thought was actually killing that spread of Christianity would be ultimately the point and place in which John would receive these visions. Now, today, in our context, it isn't so different. Everywhere we look, Christianity is being twisted, it's being turned, and it's being mutilated by our culture. But even more dangerously, as it will get addressed in Revelation, it is getting changed by the church itself. The truth of God is distorted for the likening of personal preferences and opinions, and I might add, popularity. But here's the thing. I, I want you to know this. As our mission at Center Point United Methodist Church is to know Jesus and make him known is not going to come by us being popular. It's not going to come by us having a new building. It's not going to be coming by us having a cute and quirky program. We live into that mission by being obedient disciples to Jesus Christ. We live into that mission by knowing God's word. We live into that mission by being deeply rooted in a relationship with Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you and I, accepting and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and living that out captively every single day of our lives and not being uprooted by whatever Satan might throw our way. Like the early Christians we are given revelation for knowing the characteristics of God and encouragement, the complaints and how they're living, correction to change, and we're given a conclusion. And we need to heed to what God is unveiling before us. This is God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, unveiling to us, disclosing to us, revealing to us what has happened and what will happen. Okay, I hope you're still tuning in because that was just the introduction. You ready? Here we go. Let's uh, get into our word and break this down. We're just gonna uh, we're gonna break this down as we read through it. So we're gonna start off in Revelation chapter one, verse one. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servant what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel. To his servant John. Okay, let's break that down for a second. The revelation, so we already talked about that, this unveiling, this disclosing from Jesus Christ. This is a, a unveiling of the divine ministries, which God the Father gave to Jesus to show his servants. Notice that's plural, that the word servants, his servants, is, is also understood as the believers. This revelation, this divine unveiling given by God to Jesus, to the believers, is for what must soon take place. And he made this known by sending his angel. And that's a, a divine messenger to his servant John. So we have John as a conduit sending out to other believers. And this is what it continues to say who testifies to everything he saw. Now when it says when he saw, that means the visions that he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now those are two foundational parts for us to begin revelation. We have to always come back. We always have to know that, that this is in and through Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit, and this is the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Ah, but here's, here's the beautiful part. Something so unique about Revelation as we get into verse 3 here. It says this, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Now hear this, that first word in verse 3, blessed. Where do we hear that prior to Revelation? We hear that in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, from chapter 5 to chapter 7. In chapter 5, Jesus says, blessed are those. Blessed are those. This whole book of Revelation starts off with a beatitude. It starts off with a blessing to you and to me. 
Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So what's our goal in this? We want to read it aloud, we want to hear it, and we want to take it to heart. Reading on, verse 4. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Now we're going to get into this in the next two chapters, but the, the map we'll, we'll show next week will be very interesting and help maybe geographically point you in the right direction because these seven churches are actually in a circle. And what we would know today is, is modern Turkey, this, this, this Asia Minor, all of these churches are addressed in clockwise position. And we'll get into that too. But we, we read on in verse 4, it says, Grace and peace to you from who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Now, let's, let's talk about this for a second. Grace and peace. Now, that's, that's not too uh, strange for us to hear that because that's oftentimes how the Apostle Paul opened up. Grace and peace, it's a, it's a greeting, right? But what, why is grace and peace, why are those two words specifically used? Grace is the opening indication that God and His unmerited favor, His salvation is present for us. And peace that's the reconciliation that only God can provide. Now we get into the phrase, who is, who was, and who is to come. Now it's interesting in how, how John is, is putting this, who is. So he's talking about present tense, he, who was, talking about past, and who is to come. Talking about future. Why would he start with who is? Because the, the readers that are going to be receiving this, the people that understand this language, this how he is presenting the characteristics of God here, are not used to who is first. It, it would sound something like this, who was, who is, and who is to come. And one of the earliest places that we see this is in Exodus chapter 3, verses uh, 14 through 15, where Moses asked God, who are you? And God says, I am who I am. And so, who is? This means that God is present and active. God is alive. Jesus is still resurrected and is still ascended into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God the Father. The Holy Spirit is the life and the foundation lived out in the Christian life. Ultimately, God is here and now. Who was? Our creator from the beginning to the end, Genesis to Re Revelation, into eternity. God always. Who was? If we, we go back to the Gospel of John and the, the first 14 verses there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The, the, the whole emphasis here. Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, they've always been. Always been. And who is to come. Our eternal forever and forever home. Always, always existed outside of our time and space and what's so beautiful here in the power and presence of Jesus Christ, God enters into our time and space. So God is eternal from beginning, the middle, and the end. He is who is, who was, and who is to come. Now, we get to the next one. Seven spirits. What, what is being talked about here in the seven spirits? This is a reference back to Isaiah. And this is the Holy Spirit's attributes. The spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the wisdom. Spirit of understanding. Spirit of counsel. Spirit of might. Spirit of knowledge. And spirit of fear. All different attributes of the spirit. Now, there are different understandings, there are different uh, translations, there's different scholars that say different things about what the seven spirits mean here, but, but I don't want to get too headstrong. I don't want us to dive into that and, and get lost in that to what is being told here through the power of the seven spirits. Now, it says, and before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the king's of the earth. That's verse 5. From Jesus, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus 
is the faithful son of the throne. As the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 38 says, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is the first to be resurrected from the dead and Lord of heaven and earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, as we read on, and has made us known, to, made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Did you know when Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and me, and when we be, become humble and obedient servants as disciples of Jesus Christ, when we live into that, when we accept what God has done for us, when we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, God has made us a kingdom. And it also goes on to say, and priests to serve his God and Father. God has given you and I. That, that's what we're equipped with. That's what we're commissioned with. Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You and I are given that. And then we read into chapter 7, or verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now this is a reference to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, chapter 7, verses, verse 13. And then also in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, there are these images of these prophecies of these visions that have come beforehand that, that he is referencing back to. So he's, he's speaking to his audience here. He's, he's pulling in what they know for them to understand the one who was and who is and who is to come. And he ends by saying, so shall it be, which if you didn't know, that's what amen means. It's a double amen. Amen, amen, so shall it be. And he goes into this, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The beginning of the beginning and the end of the end, the Alpha and the Omega in the Greek language, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of the alphabet and the end of the alphabet. It's again an echo of what was spoken to Moses in the burning bush. I am that I am. And again in Isaiah 44, verse 6, I am the first and the last. There is no other God beside me. Now, here we go. Let's get into, let's get into this vision of Christ. As, as Brenda did a great job of illustrating, having us close our eyes, trying to imagine, trying to contemplate what's taking place here in verses 9 through 20. I, I want to go through this, and, and we're going to break this down a little bit, and, and in a way that hopefully it's helpful for you to understand. And again, I'm asking for grace because there's so much here that I'm learning that maybe there's something that God has spoken to you and revealed to you that might be a little different. So let's read this. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance, now that's interesting, and can I, I, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and your patient endurance, that are ours in Jesus, was on this island of Patmos because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. So on the Sabbath day, he's in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches of Ephesus, of Smyrna, of Pergamum, of Thyatira, of Sardis, of Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And then I turned and saw seven gold lampstands. Among the lampstands were, was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. 
Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We've, we're given this imagery as John sees Jesus. He's on the Sabbath day in the Spirit, and he's prompted, write on a scroll what you see, and then send it to these seven churches. And we'll talk more about those churches next week. But then he turned around, because remember, he's, he's hearing this, write on this scroll to these seven churches, and then John turns around. And he says, when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. Someone, like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, golden sash around his chest. Now this is all imagery of, of what has taken place before, and all the, all the ways of the temple priests and, and, and everything that's happened. The hair on his head is white like wool and is white like snow. An imagery of him being pure without sin. And his eyes were like blazing fire. He sees all things in heaven and earth. And he sees into our heart and soul. And other prophets of the Old Testament, if we read through what their encounters were, couldn't see. They were like dead, face down on the ground. And his voice was the sound of rushing waters. Well, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, refined by fire, ready to trample any enemy. Now think with me here for a second. The only other place that we popularity, the popular imagery that we use is the armor of God given to us by the Apostle Paul. Put on the shield, put on the, the belt, put on the breastplate, put on the helmet. But here, Jesus Feet like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice sounded like rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. These are the messengers. These are the angels that are going to go to the seven churches. And coming out of his mouth is a sharp double-edged sword. Which means that's his word. That's his, his word given to us. That's his, his judgment. And his face was like the shining sun in all its brilliance. God is the visible, present deity. And John says this in verse 17, When I saw him, I fell to my feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. What comes to your mind when you hear these words? Is it the, the imagery that, that Brenda helped paint into our minds? Because you and I both know there's a lot of different ways that this world tries to interpret this imagery that's given here. Oftentimes you see in the comic strips of the pearly white gates and everybody's in a line trying to get in and, and, and God's standing there with the book of all the deeds. But this first image of what we're given of Jesus Christ is that God is all loving. God is all powerful. God is a just God. There will be judgment. That we are to know him. We are to know his word. And also something that we sometimes look past. As John is interpreting what he sees here. The image of God right smack dab in the middle of everything going on. 
God isn't distant. God isn't up in the sky and away from us. Isn't, isn't ignoring what's taking place. But here in Revelation, it's a beginning with the very presence of Jesus Christ. The very present reality that, that in the midst of everything that's taking place, in the midst of this unveiling of, of, of what Jesus Christ is talking about, of this Christian persecution, of everything in the world, this evil of Satan, He's present. He's right in the middle. He's right in the middle of your and I lives. But we have to be able to, to see that. We have to have our hearts softened and open to see God at work in that. And this is, this is what I want us to take away from this to start off. There's three points. First is this. It's simple. Jesus is with us. In verses 9 through 12, I truly believe that it is describing that, that Jesus is is in the middle of all of it with us. And number two is this. God is in power and has the glory. John falls down at the sight of Jesus, and we we too must bend our knees to God, willingly to fall flat on our faces for Christ. And three... Jesus is the one who holds the keys to death and hell. If we are in Christ, we shall not be afraid of anything in this world and in this life or the next. When we are in Christ, we're in the eternal promise right here, right now. So I ask you, Do you see? Do you perceive? Do you understand? Are you open to acknowledging that Jesus is present here with us? Do you believe that God is in power and and has all glory? Do you believe that Jesus is the one who holds eternity, that Jesus has the end of our lives? Because we're going to discover so much more about how we're living right now And what is to come by studying Revelation? Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of of pressure from this world, both then and today, Lord, that you are the one who is, who was, and who is to come. We praise you and we glorify you, God. We ask and pray that we would take to heart these words as as you give us that in the first few verses, that these words would be written or spoken aloud, that they would be taken to heart. God, may you do that in our lives this week, that we would grow closer to you in our obedience as disciples, that we would grow closer to one another in our lives as well. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, we ask and pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you this week. May you take every opportunity, every, every opportunity to share this good news of Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen.